good evening and welcome to Her Sport Awards. I'm your host, Neve Tallon, founder of Her Sport, and I'm joined by our MC for the night, Grania McElwain. We are celebrating five years of the Her Sport Awards and are thrilled to be together again to celebrate another year of incredible achievements. We have had multiple world champions, European champions, many, many medals, Irish records standing for decades fall, and of course, World Cup qualification. 2022 has delivered even more than expected, setting us up for an exciting few years as we look towards the World Cup, European and World Championships, Olympic and Paralympic Games coming down the track. Tonight would not be possible without the support of our sponsors, Energia 3 and Whoop. It's great to have been working with you all over the last 12 months on different projects and even better to be working together again on the Hearst Board Awards. Thank you to TG Cahir for helping us reach those at home and also to our hosts, UCD. The ongoing support and commitment to women in sport is clear with each and every one of you. I'll now pass you over to Grania. Mila Boyakus and Nia Vashan agus falsha war riva handena on shahanog kig okaj specialta. Tomaj e kela ra blin ele inta e sport na man agus e gleru omos don nam ras spragul ata anim naha don the gradam her sport. It has been another outstanding year for Irish sport where our female athletes have been to the fore once more. Tonight is a night of celebration, is it not? Is it not a night of celebration? <laughs> where we honour and recognise the achievements that they have done. So the awards this evening have been voted for by you at home and we look forward to bringing them to you throughout this evening. So we have five awards to present, Cardamuch Tooth, Lesh and Cade Gratham Martian. And here are the nominees for the Her Sport Young Athlete of the Year Award, sponsored by WHOOP. Athlete of the Year, sponsored by Whoop, is Rashida Adelecki. So congratulations to Rashida Adelecki, who couldn't be with us here tonight as she's back in Texas preparing for the indoor season. She's off to a great start for 2023 as she broke the 200 meter Irish indoor record and got a world lead time already this year. Hi everyone, Rashida here. I hope you all enjoyed the award so far. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. I'm still currently at school in the US. But I just want to say a big, big thank you to everyone who voted for me to become the Young Sports Star of the Year. I really, really appreciate it. Um, 2022 was a huge year for me. You know, it was my first time kind of breaking into the senior ranks. And just to see that everyone recognised my hard work and my success last year, I'm just so grateful. I'm so thankful. And I just want to thank absolutely everyone who was on my side, who was rooting for me last year. My coaches, my friends, my family, just anyone who was kind of hoping for my success. I really, really appreciate it. And I just hope to carry that on to 2023. Um, I just want to say a big thank you once again, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the awards. You're holding a couple of Irish records at the moment, both indoors and outdoors. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a bit about that. Like, how does it feel, and how do you stay motivated? Um, you know, competing, you know, week in week out. No, it feels amazing. Um, like I, I guess I never realised how big a deal it is to have a national record. Like you're the fastest to ever run it in all the years Ireland has existed. Do you know what I mean? And I never really realised it because I felt like straight after I achieved something, I'd have to move on to the next competition and I want to achieve more. And like, you know, when success comes, I just want more and more and more. Like, I'm just success greedy at this point. So like, yeah, I never really got to sit down and kind of like realize what I've done. And I guess this is kind of an opportunity just to reflect at the end of the year, like, well, I'm really grateful to God that I'm able to do what I do and inspire people and, you know, do this successfully. And, you know, yeah, I'm just so grateful, but, um, no, I just want to keep on going keep on inspiring people, but keep on breaking records and, you know, raising the standards so yeah i'm excited there's a new crop of irish women like just absolutely smashing it so i'm just happy to be about um part of that and you mentioned the 400 and it's a it's a new event mm. how are you enjoying it i know you said you're going to mix it up with the 100 yeah so. no yeah i like running the 400 I, I don't mind it 
I'm, I like it more now than I used to. When I horse ride, like, oh my God, it hurts so bad. It still hurts, but not as bad. I'm able to deal with it better. But um, it was to train. Like, so I didn't train for it last year, so I'm starting to train for it this year. And oh my God, I remember my first session, I wanted to quit, like athletics in general that day. And now I'm adapting to it better now. Um, it still hurts awfully, but I guess it'll be worth it now that I'm going to have the strength to like keep fighting for the last couple of meters that I had my weakness in in the previous year. So you're looking at making finals on the international stage and there'll be European championships, world championships coming up over the next couple of years, but the Olympics obviously in Paris will be as well. Um, what is the, the aspiration for the Olympic Games? Yeah, um, I guess we'll figure that out next year. <laughs> no, but it's always definitely to make the final and see where we go from there. You know, once you make a final, all you need is a lane and anything can happen. Like we've seen it in multiple championships, like the amount of upsets that, upsets that they've been. So like, so all you need is a lane and that's the opportunity that you need. So, yeah. And has that always been a dream of yours? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like Olympic medalist, Olympic gold medalist, everything. Like that's always been the dream. So hopefully in the future, that's something I can achieve. And we welcome Roman for the award. 2022 saw world champions, 27-year-old records fall, an Irish woman headline, Madison Square Gardens, and more success which captured a nation. It certainly seemed to be the year of Katie's. Here are the nominees for Her Sport Athlete of the Year. Kehi Ambuchar Martian, the winner of the Her Sport Athlete of the Year is Amy Broadhurst. <laughs> Kogar, just more, Amy. Take a seat there. I don't know if it's the good news or the bad news when you win is that you have to speak to me, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> Just let's talk about last year. I mean, what a phenomenal achievement. Gold medal, European, Commonwealth, the Worlds. Have you had time to reflect on all that? And what have, you, what have your thoughts been on that? It was probably like a, a year of dreams come true because um, since I've been boxing, I've been boxing since I was five years old. And I've always said that I wanted to go to the Olympics, become a world champion and just win as much as possible. and to to achieve everything I did last year was incredible and something I probably never thought would happen in, in the one year. So it was the best year of my life. Absolutely, we all enjoyed watching you, didn't we, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> bring, bring me back though to the start of that year because we all remember COVID. I mean, it, it wasn't ideal preparation, it was hard to get fights, etc., cetera, and, and what was going to happen. So talk to me about your frame of mind at the start of 2022 and how that changed or how did you get it to change to end up winning three gold medals? Well, at this time last year, I was uh, speaking to a psychologist called Paul because um, from 2020, the beginning of 2020 to the beginning of 2022, it just seemed like nothing was ever going to work out really because I had, I, I took seven months out in 2020 because mentally, just nothing was going in my favour. I came back and I was able to spend um, three weeks in my Zaki for the Olympic training camp. And that was, that was amazing and it gave me the itch to get to the Olympics. And because of COVID, there was no competitions happening. So it was training, training, training. And we were meant to go to Bulgaria then in February of last year and I got COVID. And so that put me out of the competition and I just thought like, it's one thing after another and the psychologist Paul was was brilliant to me and I still speak to him um, whenever I'm having tough days and um, then this email came in from Tomas Rohan, Katie Taylor's manager and basically saying would you like to come over, Katie's requested for your help to get ready for the Serrano fight and 
straight running into the parents. I was like, look at this, this is madness. Yeah. Um, and I went and I spent two weeks in, in Connecticut with Katie and I th the ball just started rolling from there. It was one thing after another and it was two years of difficult times made worth it for the year that I had. It was, it was amazing. Katie Taylor was a huge role model for you growing up, wasn't she? So when you go and you're sparring with her, what way did she change you as a boxer? What way did she help you? Yeah, um, I remember going over on the plane, I kind of thought, how am I going to get on here? Because this lady's after being a trailblazer for women's, women's boxing and she's the best that's ever come out of Ireland. And to get into the ring and, and be able to help her and get the feedback that she gave me. Um, I was able to ask her questions and probably get advice in things that I needed, like what should I work on? Or she, she was just amazing to me. And even she's the, like, I've, I had a, a bad weekend last week and she was one of the first people to message me and to try and encourage me. And, she, she's just an amazing person and I'm, I'm, I'm winning every time because I have someone like her in my corner. We'll talk about the BAB again a little bit later on. We're going to focus on 2022, first of all. But in terms of, of what you learned from Katie Taylor, when you came back home, like what was the message that resonated the most in you? If you can get into the ring with Katie Taylor and survive and, and do well against her, <laughs> I think you can get into the ring with anybody in the world and do very well. So to me, when I went to the, the World Championships, it was like, I probably took a one fight at a time rather than I tended to think too far ahead. And it, it, it worked, so it did. It, just the belief I had in myself last year, it all came from, from Katie and, and the feedback she was giving me. And I think it, the more I achieved, the more I was believing in it. Like at the beginning, it was like, right, I'm good. I'm decent enough at this. But then by the end of the year, I was, I was like, I can actually go and do very, very good things in boxing. I think you're a little bit more than decent, David. I think you are. <laughs> so, but when you're leaving your room and you're in the zone heading up to the ring, what do you be thinking about? How, how do you calm the nerves? Um, I don't think you can really calm them. I, every time I put the gloves on and they're being wrapped up, I'm kind of thinking, what am I thinking? Why am I in this sport? <laughs> because um, so you're getting in and someone's trying to take the head of you and <laughs> there's no other way to put it. Um, but the way I look at it is, like, uh, as I said, I've been boxing since I was five and I really, really believe that this is what I was born to do. And um, the way my life has worked out, I truly believe that that's the reason why I'm here. And, and I genuinely believe there's something bigger waiting for me, no matter where I go in boxing. So We could see the emotion, and it, and it is very emotional when you see athletes winning gold medals or, or, or silver or bronze, and, and what it means to you when the national anthem over on the vein has been played as well. When you're getting that medal placed on you, who do you think of? That's a tough question. <laughs> um, who do I think of? Probably just myself and... and I think when I won the Worlds, I was standing on the podium and it was just like, I can't believe I'm world champion. It was like a dream come true. And you, you think back on all the years of setbacks and everything, and it, it, it's just that one little moment makes all of the badness and the ups and the downs just disappear. Um, so that's probably what I'd be thinking of. Or like my family, my family be very proud of me. So That's great. That's lovely to hear that. You mentioned earlier on about the little setback or the little last weekend at the, at the elite finals. Just talk to us about it. Have you had time to process that defeat and what yeah. have you taken away from it? You're going to probably think I'm absolutely mad for saying it, but the, the majority of me is actually pretty happy that I lost because all last year I built up this bubble and it, like all expectations was on you. Amy's not going to lose. Like She's world champion. She's won this this is a given to her, she's going to win this, no problem. And that was happening no matter where I went. And it's probably the same for, for other athletes as well. So to get in and, and lose in such a close fight um, and for that bubble to, to pop, it was probably the way that the world off my shoulders. Um, I, I didn't find the pressure too bad when I was at international competitions, but I found it very, very difficult over here in Ireland where my home, my home looking at me and um, I think 
like I learned from it, the hunger's back. I was kind of at the top and finding it very hard to, what do I do next, what do I do next? Now I'm not rock bottom, but I'm back down to square one and I'm, I'm determined to build my way back up again. It, it was a different weight, it's, it's a higher weight, the 66 yeah. kilograms. So just explain to us the difference in that and the challenges in, in going from, was it 62, 63 kilograms yeah. up to 66? Yes. Naturally, um, I, I went to the Commonwealth Games at 60 kilos and um, just the way things work out in the weight situation, I can't really go 60 kilos. 63 kilos isn't in the Olympics, so it was 66 kilos then and it's, you're, you're just getting in with bigger girls, stronger girls and, and it's, it's, I probably stand out a little bit because I'm so small compared to them, but I'm not, I'm not too fussed about it. I'm, I, I know I'm capable of doing very well, so. So the goal then is Paris still on the cars, the Olympics next year? Yeah, it's still, it's still lit anywhere for now. Um, I know there's going to be assessments and um, competitions coming up where I'll get to prove that I'm, I'm able to go with 66. So the, the, the door is still open for now and if it, if, it's, if it closes on me and I don't get to the Olympics in 2024, I'll sit and I'll, I'll see what's next for me. Do I go pro? or do I wait around until 2028? Um, because I've said it in interviews before that I said I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop until I got to the Olympics and became Olympic champion. So um, I don't like breaking promises and that's a big promise I have to myself. So um, we'll, we'll see what happens. But Paris 2024 is, is the goal. And finally as well, I think I read somewhere that you wrote a story um, when you were 11 years old about yourself going back to Dundalk with Olympic gold medal and seeing the crowds of people around waiting for you. When you went back to Dundalk with those medals last year, what was that like? And did it live up to what your 11 year old expectations Yeah, were it was amazing because like I've, I've won a couple of European titles before and you'd have a crowd at the airport for you and then you kind of come home and it's quiet and then I went and I won the world gold medal and I came back and my whole my whole estate was out for me and I was like some superstar that's been living there all my whole life but they've never seen me before like <laughs> I didn't know myself like what was going on um, and I found it very emotional and then I I always go back to my primary school that I was at because they're very good to me and they uh, they read out this letter that I wrote and it's mad to think that that was an 11 year old girl and. I'm 26 this year and, and the dream came true then. It's not an Olympic gold medal, but a world gold medal and it came true 14, 15 years later. It's a, a madness, it's crazy. To, the dream was in me, even at that age. You still got three medals though last year. It was, it was good too. <laughs> Just for young boys and girls watching on this, you know, you wrote that story when you were 11. What advice would you give to them about their dreams and their sporting ambitions? Just not to give up um, because some people may think that the journey is always going to be straightforward, smooth, smooth sailing. And I can tell you now 100% that's not the case. And like you might think you're never going to get to where you really want to be. And just keep pushing and don't give up. And I guarantee you'll get there one way or another. Well, Amy, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Go to Mila Moig, Zavet Lynn. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, please, for Amy Bradhurst. Welcome to Jirai Morshin Gaji Argeb Gradamela for Furlan Nablena. This award recognises the exceptional achievements of Irish teams in a single calendar year, with representatives from nine different sports making the list. Here are the nominees then for the Her Sport Team of the Year, sponsored by Three.
And the winner of the Her Sport Team of the Year, sponsored by three, is the Irish soccer team. We're delighted to be joined by Anya O'Gorman, who'll accept this award on behalf of the team. So well done, Johnny. I'll get you to take a seat and I'll just ask Lisa Fallon to come up as well to join us. Great to have you both. Thanks for joining us this evening. Anya, well done. You're getting used to collecting these awards now, but just explain to us what the last few months have been like for you personally and your family since Ireland have qualified for the World Cup. Yeah, to be honest, I think it's still very surreal. Um, it's still kind of hard to believe that we're finally going to a World Cup. I think it's something that we've all dreamed of as a kid growing up, anyone that that plays football dreams of playing in the World Cup and obviously now to qualify and live that dream is, is pretty amazing. Um, 2022 has been obviously an unbelievable year for that and now we're, I think it's kind of relieved that we're in 2023 now and we're finally preparing to, to go to Australia this summer. We heard Amy speaking about writing that letter when she was 11 year old about wanting to win an Olympic gold medal. Had you that ambition as a child for a World Cup? Was that one of your dreams that you hoped you would get to? Yeah, definitely. I think um, as soon as I started playing for Ireland, you start thinking you want to play in a major tournament. And I think it was always going to be the breakthrough moment for women's football um, in this country. So it's just amazing how it all kind of happened, obviously. Um, came second in the group, the game against Finland, and then, then the away game against Slovakia, and then obviously the playoff against Scotland. And we still didn't know on that day if we won, we got sorry to the direct playoff, if we won that day would we go straight through and other results went their way so it was just um, kind of hard to believe and it feels like it's, it's just meant to be. Mm -hmm. Lisa just put into context the scale of the achievement achieved by these girls. Oh listen it's amazing I remember when I was 12 and the Republic of Ireland qualified, the men's team qualified for Euro 88 and uh, for anyone who remembers that time it was the whole country just went absolutely nuts. It's the only way I can describe it. And, you know, Ireland were in a tough group. You know, the, the opening game was against England. I mean, of all the teams to play. And then Ireland go and beat them 1-0. And it was just incredible because it didn't just have an impact for people who loved sport. It made an impact on the whole country. And Irish people started to believe they could be more than they had ever maybe thought about before and I, I just loved and it was so it's such a special moment because it, I think it really changed our whole society that that when we when when Ireland qualified and then two years later they qualified for the World Cup in 1990 or 1990 um, and I think you know as a girl growing up then I remember I, I loved football and it was the only thing I ever wanted to do but I remember I distinctly remember looking at it and going I've never seen a woman or a girl in football on TV, on the sidelines, playing in stadiums. Um, and I actually went through a process where I was going, I actually wished I'd been a boy because I, f I loved football that much and I just didn't see how it would be possible. And that's what these girls have changed that because there's little girls here today um, and all over the country who've been inspired and little boys as well. And I think that's, that's probably going to be the longest lasting legacy of what this what these girls and like they you, you fought for a lot you know you know it wasn't just about qualifying you you, you cheat a lot more for for women and in, in not just football but in sport in general um and that's why i think the impact of this will be really really long lasting because they won't just inspire a generation of of young irish footballers they're going to inspire a whole country i've no doubt about it as players on you though, are you aware of that impact? Do you see it? Yeah, I, I think as players we always knew that um, we had a responsibility to be role models in the way after 2018 and the threat to strike and looking for better conditions. In a way we probably put that pressure back on ourselves then that we had to be successful and achieve more and I think um, we've tr thrived in that, under that pressure and getting uh, crowds into Tallah Stadium. Um, I think we just relish them occasions now and um, look where obviously their improved conditions have gotten us as well. We always believed that we could do it and we're quite frustrated that we weren't given that, that platform to, to perform and hopefully that will just improve things which it already has for the young players coming through. There's two girls came over to me already tonight, Holly and another girl that plays um, out in step aside as well and it's just obviously um, great to see and that, that means just as much to me personally as it does 
um, realms of the World Cup. What way has Vera Powell, has she changed you all as players and as people? Yeah, I think there's just more of a belief amongst the squad, a belief that wasn't there before, that we are capable of this. We're a very talented bunch of players, a lot of players playing across the water in England and Denise O'Sullivan in America. Um, I think we have a way of playing, we know our style of play, every player goes out on the pitch, knows their task. Um, so I think that's, that's been the recipe for success. Um, look how few goals we've conceded throughout the campaign and I think that'll be the focus going forward. Obviously we'll stick to the same process and just focus on the areas that, that we can improve and really uh, looking forward to that opening game against Australia, obviously going in a, as underdogs um, in an 80,000, hopefully Cedar Stadium and um, look, we're just gonna, gonna um, enjoy the, the occasion. Because that's a, the, the good times are over in a way that we, we've spoke about it now. It's down to brass tacks. It's now it's getting massive preparation for this. At least you've been involved in the Men's World Cup. So in a practical level, level then, what should we expect that the girls will be doing now over the next while? I think th if there's one job you wouldn't want right now, it'd be Vera Powell's because she's going to have some task picking that squad of 23. Um, you think of the players that started the campaign, there was players who got injured who weren't on the pitch and in the squad at the end of the campaign, but they're all coming back to fitness now. And I think, you know, I'm sure every one of you are aware of, of the competition for places, young players that are putting their hands up during the campaign that will fancy a seat on the plane as well. Um, and it's about, you know, training, doing all the good things, you know, you're eating, you're sleeping, because like I said, it's, it's going to be extremely competitive to get into the squad and that's really good for Ireland, you know, because there's so much talent coming through and, you know, the, there's incredible work going on at grassroots level and across all the clubs in the country, you know, coaches who are volunteers and people in clubs who are volunteers and giving their time to develop these players and uh, it must be so, give them great pride to see these players now going on to the world stage, but you know, I think for players, you're really focused, you're, you're getting your fitness up, you're playing your games, focusing on your club and doing everything to make sure that when that final sheet is being, and the names are being filled in on it, that your name is, is on it. But it will be really competitive. And um, I think that'll be really good actually for the Women's National League this year. I think that will add another edge to it as well, because I think everyone will want to, everyone will know they're, they're, you know, they're being looked at. And uh, so I think the Women's National League is going to be phenomenal this year as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, look, anyone involved in, in women's football that's been on the fringes and especially, I think, like Lisa mentioned, we had such a big squad and that's obviously one of the things, strengths of era as well, that everyone was prepared. Like I hadn't played a game since the Slovakia home game and I played in the playoff against Scotland and I was ready um, on the day and you just look at that and only 23 players um, will be in the squad in Australia. Sometimes you bring away 26, 27 players to, to games in the, in the qualifiers. So look, it's going to be hugely competitive. I think the Women's National League is going to be really exciting. Obviously, like I've moved over to Shamrock Rovers um, I think the whole standard of the, the league is, is just going to rise and piggyback on the success of the women's national, league, women's national team. Sorry. So when you head off, you mentioned Ireland will be underdogs in this group. Like it's a tough, tough group. But what does success look like for you, on in this World Cup? Um, winning the World Cup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, I think um, obviously one game at a time, and if we get out of the group um, into the knockouts, and we take it game by game, and. Look, I think we're very, very capable. Um, there's no, going to be no easy groups when you get to the World Cup and um, just focusing on that opening game and the preparation um, to get us there at the moment. For you, Lisa, what is success for Ireland? I think the fact that Ireland are there and not just the, the team are there. I think Michelle O'Neill is here tonight as well and she's an Irish referee and she's going to be there as well. And, you know, we're, we're represented all the way through, which, is, which I think is brilliant. But I think, you know, the team... Just listening to Anya, like she says there, what does success look like winning the World Cup? I know she means that. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's brilliant about this is the change in the mindset. It's not about, oh, look, we'll just go and we'll see how we get on. And, you know, it's a very tough group making excuses before you even go. You don't get that from this team. Um, you know, they're, they're taking it game by game. The belief is there. They know, I mean, played, beat Australia in a, in a friendly in Tallis Stadium. 
um, not that long ago, last year, the year before. Um, so they know they can beat Australia. And that was a strong Australian team that played that day. Um, so there's nothing to fear. You get your performance right on the day and you can beat anybody and they know it. Um, and they're going to have incredible support over there. They could potentially be the best supported team in, in the World Cup. And I don't doubt that for a second. They're already talking about changing the stadium because you know, it's, it's sold out so quickly. So, but that's the impact that they'll have. But they'll be really, I know they'll be really focused and ready for it and um, take one game at a time. It is a cliche, but if you do it like that, similar to what Amy said about one fight at a time, you know, just do your job on the day and let, let the rest, it'll, it'll take you to where it's meant to take you then. Does your mindset have to change on you? Is it, is it a different way of approaching this? It's a World Cup. It's something that I've strived for so long to be there. Are people making it bigger than it actually is? And what I mean by your mindset is that because it's one day time, you haven't made this preparation before, does that change how you approach this game? Um, I don't think so. I think we stick to the process, what's worked for us in the World Cup qualifiers to get us to the World Cup. Obviously, we have to fine tune certain areas and um, as a team and individually as well. We'll all have had individual meetings with Vera and, and be focusing on them as well. So, yeah, look, I know it is a cliche and I'd be very task driven, uh, stay in the moment, play in the moment. Like, obviously, we went out in that Scotland game, high pressure game, played the game against Ukraine in the European Championship to qualify for the Euros the year before. We learned a lot from that high pressure game. Um, I obviously put the ball in my own net and look, we bounced back from that. Um, and I think that's shown great character. And ironically, you talk about the Australia game. For me, that was the turning point for the team. Um, it came off the back of the equal pay stand. Again, you talk about pressure, more pressure, putting back on ourselves again. Um, so look, I think it is just stick to the process. Like I go back to the Scotland game, I know I said it already. But look, that was, I hadn't played in a long time. If we had lost that game, probably never would have played for Ireland again. You go out, focus on your tasks, stay in the moment, um, and the rest take care of yourself. Just, um, we've mentioned a few times there about 2017 and, and looking for f fairness and respect. And 2017 isn't that long ago, really, when you think about it. But there were very dark days for Irish sport, Lisa, and, and just for the girls having to go and do that. But everyone is supporting this team. From where we're looking at, there's a, there's a massive goodwill towards them. But has enough been done in the intervening years towards women's football in this country, do you think? I feel really strongly about it. I think, um, I think there's every girl should have the same access to the same facilities and same resources and same standard of coaching and same <coughs> amount of coaching time in every club as every boy of the same age. And every club can do that. You don't need money, that's just, you just do that. Um, so no under eight boy should be getting more than any under eight girl. And, and, and the same all the way up, all the way up to senior level. And I think that's, if you can change that in your club, you can change a lot. Um, and I think what's really good about this team, um, the, the battle that they fought, what they've also done with that is shown that when you do get the right investment and when you do get um, access to the same resources and all the rest of it, the difference it makes. And you can go and achieve then. And I mean, I think for many, many years in Ireland, um, Irish women and Irish sports people, uh, you know, sports women have achieved despite the funding they got and despite the resources they got. And now when they get them, and I think we've seen in the last two years, you know, the, the, the way Irish sports women and athletes and coaches are developing and changing the game and achieving on the world stage is a vindication of that process. And I think it's really important that you know, we stop, we don't, I think sometimes we settle too much for crumbs and we're grateful for too little. And I think we have to change that. And I, we shouldn't be ashamed or we shouldn't be hiding behind ourselves to say, no, it should be the same. It should be the same, at least. Um, and, and I think we're getting there and I think we, there's a lot more to be done, but I think we're gone beyond the time of any excuses. Irish girls and Irish women who are into sports deserve exactly the same as the lads. And you look and you'll see, you know, the success that's happening now, we're going to get even more. And I think what I love as well is I think um, the young girls today now are not afraid to ask for it because they see it where we might have been a little bit more timid and, and that, but it is changing and it's amazing. Um, you know, and I think if everyone rose in together, 
men are allies for women and women are, are allies for women and, and if we do it together I think we can achieve so so much more and I think that's where I think that's the real land shift that we're starting to see in the last couple of years. Anya are you happy what what has been achieved over the past number of years or is there still a lot more room for improvement? Look I think we're always going to be um, looking to improve and improve standards and um, certainly there has been um, many improvements, conditions, um, or even see it in the Women's National League um, teams and looking for equality. And my own club in NSK where I grew up playing football, I would have grew up playing football with the boys and I loved playing football with the boys and I think it stands me later on in my career. I think there's probably as many, if not more, girls teams now than there is boys teams. So that shows progress to me. And like Lisa said, it's getting access to good coaching, good structures, um, and it's changing all the time. But um, I think there's, there's still a little bit of work to do. But I'll leave the final word with you. What is the most exciting thing you're looking forward to in the World Cup? The opening game against Australia. <laughs> we will leave it there, Anya. We wish you every success. As you know, you can hear the sound here. Everybody watching the whole country and all the Irish around the world are wishing you all the very, very best of luck. Enjoy it all. Lisa and Anya, Gormila Maigets of Edlin. We're delighted to celebrate and give our elite athletes who are achieving at the highest level the recognition they deserve. But tonight we also wanted to acknowledge the volunteers who are at grassroots to elite level and are at the heart of sport and community. Energy are proud to celebrate every community volunteer and beside, behind the scenes heroes who make the sports we love possible. After an overwhelming number of entries with some incredible stories and worthy winners, this year's Her Sport Community Award, sponsored by Energia, goes to Deirdre McAlerney. We'd like to invite Deirdre and Lorna from Energia up to present the award. Thank you. Deirdre is one of the heartbeats of Dunamore, Ashburn GAA. She has been a volunteer for many years, waking up in the early hours on Saturday mornings, running the club shop and ensuring the girls and boys in her community can play their football, camogie or hurling. Deirdre has also been at the centre of supporting the Ukrainian nationals who have been displaced during the war, an inspiration to us all. Congratulations Deirdre and thank you for all that you do. <laughs> this year's theme of the awards is Do It For Her. On International Day of the Girl, we launched the Do It For Her campaign. Our videos were viewed by over 7 million people, shared by notable athletes and figures across the country. The campaign highlights the passion that girls have for sport, but the barriers they also have to overcome. We can all contribute to change. It's time to do it for her. Who's your favourite female athlete? Do you know any? No, no, I don't know any. Mm, yeah, like I, I like a few. Like I um, love watching Alan Keane. Would you ever stop playing sports? Um, only if like I have an injury. That's the only time I'd probably stop playing sports. Um, I want to be. I want to play for Ireland and like Chelsea or Arsenal or something. No, I will never ever stop playing sports. I don't think I'd ever imagine myself not doing sport again because it's so good. What's your favorite thing about sport in general? Well, like sport connects people in so many different ways. Like. I have so much friends and they all, I know them all because of sport, like it's just so friendly. Do you think the boys and girls are treated differently in sport? Yes. It's more of a fuss when there's like a game at like the All-Ireland Final than the girls when there's not much talk about that but there's a lot of talk when the boys do and something. You even see like if you're watching a women's football match or a camogie match on the TV, you see the difference in the amount of supporters. But like it kind of frustrates me, like it, why? Why is there so much more men than girls? Boys are treated better than girls because boys hate people think boys can do it better. Like even at a match, more people show up to a boys match than a girls match. I don't think it's fair, but I hope we can change. Like, Falsha Arash got dinner, Agus with Tommy Khan, and panel shot occur in Lahar Jeevsha Sawala. So I'm delighted to be joined by Michelle O'Neill from Wexford, referee, and will be heading to officiate in her third World Cup later on this year. Roisin Upton, Irish Hockey International Olympian and World Cup silver medalist, and Katie O'Brien, rower and para gold medalist at the recent World Rowing Championships. You're all very welcome. Give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. 
the theme of our chat is do it for her. Roisin, when you started off playing hockey, who was your person that you thought of? At the time, the current Irish hockey captain was Emer Cregan, who also played in my club team in Limerick. Um, so I could see it. Um, and when I saw it, I wanted to be it. Um, and, and, you know, still she's coaching my club team now in Catholic Institute, and she's been a huge inspiration to me since I was 12, since I started playing hockey. Um, but before that, you know, I, I played soccer when I was six and seven and I wanted to play for Ireland and then I played GAA and I wanted to play for Limerick in an All-Ireland final in Crow Park. So um, I, I played so many different sports growing up and it wasn't until secondary school that hockey was the one. Do it for her, for you, Michelle. Like, who do you think of? I was just chatting away to Katrina there two minutes ago and I, I just said it to her. I said she would have been one of the first with Sonia Sullivan that I would have saw on TV. And I was like, okay, so athletics is what I want to do. So I went and did athletics. And then you see, um, the only thing I didn't do was boxing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> I leave that to the experts. But yeah, I would have liked to say, again, would have done so many different sports, tried everything, never saw any barriers of, of what to play, but there was never opportunities to be on all girls teams. So I always joined the boys team and just played and never saw any difference. Um, and then, you know, just growing as a player, GA player and soccer player, and then coming to the point where, okay, what do I do next? And then still wanting to stay involved. And then going, I remember seeing my first ever female referee going, um, okay, females can do this. Do you know, so I never knew that you could do that. Got in to that pathway and the rest was history. So yeah, it's, it's really important to see to be able to see someone doing it. Um, and now, in the recent years, I just kind of realized that I now have that goal of, God, I'm the first to be doing what I'm doing. And, you know, reflecting on that, and, you know, you, you, you heard Anya and Lisa there, the responsibilities. And, you know, to be honest, if you're your own role model, you know, then you're pushing yourself forward. And then you can be the role model for others to follow. And that was a big, big um, kind of realization when I stood on the World Cup stage with Netherlands and, and USA and, and stepping out into my dream, finally realizing that, oh my God, this pathway is just gonna open f for everybody else. And it still have that emotion there and, and that feeling, that one moment of, of yeah, just do it for her. Yeah, it was brilliant. Talk to me about rowing, because what attracted you to that sport? I was sitting up in the, in the bed with my dad, and I remember watching it so vividly, and I said to dad, like, dad, I have to do it. Like, I need to go. This is amazing. And um, so we watched, we watched the Paralympics, and we sent an email off, and um, I got an email back to say, will you come to this talent ID day in UCD? So we went up to the day, and I, at the time, horse riding was what I was into. And like I said, I didn't even know what rowing was, but I tried the rowing machine and the guy there was like, do that again? And um, I pulled a few more strokes. He's like, one more time. <laughs> and um, about a month later, I was asked back to a training camp and I'm a competitive person and I like being good at things and I was good at rowing. <laughs> so I uh, like that rowing found me rather than me finding rowing, yeah. And did you enjoy it straight away? Yeah, loved it, loved it. Like, I, like that, I went up to, to look at horse riding, but I was more into the adrenaline side of things and dressage was the only option for horse riding at the time and I st still is for the Paralympics. So I was like, look, we're, we're here. Mom was up with me, we said, we look at the other sports and like I had watched rowing in the Olympics that summer as well with my brother and he was telling me all the facts of look how fast they're going and you know, so I'd kind of had like, I'd seen it, but like, you know, so like I, I fell in love with it straight away. You know, the, it's the adrenaline, it's the buzz, it's the race and you're building up for that one moment, so yeah. You mentioned there one of your idols was Emer Cregan. Was she a major reason for you picking hockey or just being attracted to staying playing hockey? Absolutely, yeah. I knew that she, she wanted to go to the Olympics. Um, she competed at the a World Cup in 2022 and the Olympics was her dream. So getting to train with her in my club towards the end of her career and seeing her fight for something that no Irish team, never mind a hockey team, had ever gone to. Um, I, I loved the idea of that. And uh, it became a real, I suppose, I, I saw the pathway. Um, 
and, and chased it, yeah, and I feel like I am living the dream. Um, and, you know, I think from when I started playing with the Irish team in 2016, it's completely transformed now, six or seven years later. Um, and it's probably just a testament you know, to, to my teammates, but also to the support that we've, that we've had over the last number of years. When you told people, Michelle, that you wanted to be a referee, what did they say to you? Um, I was probably, I questioned the referee every day I played <laughs> football. And the, the girls will know, but um, yeah, I was probably one of the a referee's nightmare. But I, I always asked the questions and wanted to learn more. So yeah, look, it, um, I always wanted to stay in the sport. Didn't want to give up and I wanted to find what I was good at. And I still remember my very first refereeing game. Um, it was school, I went into school boys just in case I didn't like it and I could still play. But I went in school boys, under 10s game, and I remember the feeling of, oh my God, I, I'm teaching them the same time as, you know, telling the laws of the game. But it was a different type of role than what I had experienced as a player, you know, and I just came home and said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And that was it. And within a year, I was accepted into the School of Excellence with the FEI. Within another year, two years, then got um, better. Was on the FIFA panel. Within three years, I was um, my first FEI Cup final, um, and the, the the rest just goes on. I mean, I remember then being picked for the first ever, um, be first ever Irish person to represent um, in in the FIFA tournament, and that was in Canada in 2015, and they were looking for more uh, assistance because. The the, the 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 football was just in in in, in women uh, was just growing and growing and back uh, you were talking about the viewership and and being able to see and support in Canada we only had like half a million or a million people involved in in viewing the the world the World Cup when I was there in 2019 um, we had one billion people and we were actually on the stage going, no pressure, yeah, we're coming out and there's one billion people going to see this, this final. And you had to stay in your zone and you had to just be, no, you trained for this, you worked hard because after Canada, I got the bug. You were saying, you were, the adrenaline started. I, was, I went to the quarterfinals and I was like, because we compete as referees for the spot, there's only going to be four in the final. So we compete as well among ourselves. So you have to be the best and you have to be, you know, have your, the, the mentally, physically, emotionally, all ready um, and to be able to perform split second decisions and be correct in them decisions. And I remember coming back from Canada going, I was very emotional. I was like, no, I want to be in the final. What do I have to do to prepare to be better, you know, to go back and be picked and selected and get all the way to the um, final. And what did you have to do? Everything. Mm. I and when you say everything, why I is gave that? up my job. I I looked for a strength and condition coach. I I, I got a you know a nutrition coach. I got so much team around me. I needed more team around me because I, there wasn't much support. So I had to build it and create it. And I knew what I I needed um, to be better. And I knew um, so I just went and researched and, and got it around me and just prepared four years before and, and just every day doing something for tomorrow and just keep going you know, on. Mentally preparing, I worked more, more uh, with like, oh, I wouldn't say sports psychology, but with just more mentally believing in myself as well as, you know, people see this, just go for it and, you know, um, also kind of, I also say that you need your family in your hand because if you don't have your family support, you have nothing because it's such a lonely place. I mean, it's different for teams. You have a big team you can lean on, but as a referee, it's, it's, it can be a very, very, very lonely place if you're not strong, mentally strong, physically strong and everything. But so if you create a team around you, it it's, makes it so much easier um, to be able to achieve what you want to. And, you know, going back within, like, so that was my goal. 
in t the year before in 2018, I achieved that goal in the under 20s World Cup by getting the final medal. Um, a year before I actually had had processed, so I was on track and I knew I was on track. And then getting the team I was in, then I was in a team of French referees. So now I had to also create a bond between this team as well and to know what this referee wants from me. So there's again another team element in an individual but still team element. And then we had to work together for the same goal as well. And then the following year then we got the first uh, Irish person to represent Ireland in the World Cup final. And it was just surreal because it just built from there. And you were saying success, you follow success, Amy said it. And you were just like, the Super Cup final again. Super Cup final was huge in terms of, we were the first females in a men's sport final to ever referee in the world of sport and football. To stand on that stage and go, this is what females do in sport. And that was a huge moment because that opened the doors for every other female match official around the world. They were getting their chances. It was like, hey, look, the Europeans did it. You have to do it. And that then created the whole circle around the world. And that's what you saw then last, er, last year in the World Cup final. There were six female referees, first time ever. And that was the referee I was with, Stephanie Frappa. And, and that started years ago, you know, building, building, building and building. So this year, I am super excited because there's one different element and you all know what it is. The team are there. <laughs> so it's just so going to be so amazing and it's just I wish them all the best luck. But we'll, we'll, come, back, we'll come back to that in, in a few moments time, Michelle, absolutely. But what strikes me there is determination and that's something I want to chat to you about that and the ter determination you had to be the best um, as you possibly could be. And Kitty, you was a lovely article written by Dennis Walsh in the Irish Times recently, just interviewing you and, and your life and talking about your career. And a words jumped out of me when I read that was about, you constantly use the words determination and I'm determined and determined. You were born with spina bifida. So will you tell us a little bit about the challenges you faced as a child and where this determination to succeed came from? So like you said, I was born with spina bifida. So it's a condition that affects your spine and it can depend where your lesion is, you know, how you're affected. So for me, my right leg is slightly weaker, but my left leg, I'd have very little calf muscle. Um, I skipped leg day, no. Um, I have very little calf muscle and very little feeling or anything in my left leg, so it doesn't do much for me. But um, So growing up, the challenges would have been, you know, in and out of hospital. Um, I'd get ulcers on my foot because it's a funny shape and long stories, but in and out of hospital with that. and. Um, in and out of a wheelchair, crutches, walker, um, and so I had over 20 something surgeries, you know, by the age of 20. And so <clears throat> that word determination, you know, it's only with retrospect I've been asked that question before, you know, people say, you know, um, where does your determination come from or where does your resilience come from? And I think I, it was something that was learnt, but it wasn't, I didn't learn it by choice, um, it was out of necessity. Like I didn't choose to have those surgeries. I had to have them and I had to recover. There was no other option. Um, so I guess now when I'm faced with a challenge, you know, I face that challenge and I say like, it's something I have to do and I have to recover from it. So it's just like a surgery, you know, you go in, you get it done and you recover and you move on. So I think that's my approach uh, to things. And it's like that, something I learned and had no choice. But. That determination, Roisin, is, 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 would that be a strength or a super strength you would have? Or how have you dealt with determination over your career? Um, Katie's talking about having 20 surgeries as if it's just going out for a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think in elite sports, you have to be determined. Um, as the girls were talking about a while ago, you know, it's a roller coaster for everyone. And even within a team, you've got a roller coaster of people's journeys that are overlapping all the time. Um, for me, after secondary school, all I ever dreamt of was staying in Limerick and becoming a teacher and my family were close and I wanted to play hockey for Ireland until a, an amazing opportunity came about that I could go travel to the States and um, study and play hockey over there. 
um, and, and I jumped at it thinking actually you know what I'm going to go for it if I never make it for Ireland that was a risk that I was going to take and off the back of that um, you know I had two dub double hip surgery over there I didn't know if I would if I would ever play hockey for Ireland again you know like there's just so many things I think that you have to bounce back from and uh, w when you're growing up you just dream about playing for Ireland and nobody tells you what way the road is going to go um, because you get to experience the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, um, but it's, it's so, so worth it. You came in in, in 2016 and, and that breakthrough, and we say the word breakthrough for a lot of people that were playing Irish hockey, it's been a long, long, long time coming, getting silver in the World Cup. When you have that success, Roisin, what way did that change you, the way you looked at yourself as a player? It was a funny one, yeah. We, we snuck into the World Cup, if I'm being honest. They had changed the qualification route um, they had increased the amount of teams that could go from 12 to 16, so we were 15th there. Um, we were just absolutely delighted to be there, couldn't believe it. We are living in a bubble, then we came home and had realised people had actually heard we have an Irish hockey team. Um, so it, it probably didn't change too much, you know, the dream was still to qualify for an Olympics and that was within two years. Um, so again, we had some challenges, we had a change of a coach. Um, we had COVID, lots of things happened. Um, so I think it didn't necessarily change us. Uh, you know, it's funny being in a position now where people are familiar with who you are, but uh, our program has changed, as I was saying, over the last six years. And like, do it for her is just us trying to remain consistent so that you know, we're one of the best supported funded teams from the Sports Institute and from our private sponsors, Park Development. So we need to perform week in, week out. We need to score goals. We need to not concede goals. We need to get results so that the next generation can continue seeing Hockey Ireland at major tournaments. And, and they're the kind of things that, we, you know, that we're aware of and they're the pressures that we face every single week because our funding is dependent on that. And you know, it's so exciting and we're so grateful for it. But that, and that is the reality. Um, so yeah, in the next two years, um, we're looking at Paris. I don't think it changed us too much. Go back to the World Cup, Michelle. Um, so we're used to seeing all about the players and hearing about the build-up and the hard work. So you, you've touched on the minor work that you have to do that. So just talk to us about preparing for a World Cup. Is it completely different from every other competition? And what are you doing now to get yourself ready and prepared for come May and July? Okay, so um, I, I started preparing for this World Cup four years ago. Um, but. I'm basically just off a plane from Doha there now. I'm a little bit wobbly, but um, yeah, so we had our full week seminar and it's rigorous. I mean, we were in the VAR simulators, we're doing match preparation, uh, we're doing instant feedback with our decision making on the field, watching it back on cameras, get back out there, do more decisions. We're doing physical tests, we're doing a fitness tests, we're doing strength flexibility. So we do all this in the big group that we were in for the week. And then we have the line of, okay, where we're at and what we need to fine tune. So at the moment, we are prepared. We were already prepared as referees for six months time. What we are doing now is fine tuning our mental capacity because we're already phys physically there. Um, and we're then just kind of um, getting more into now the, the VAR simulators, the, you know, making sure that we are 200% prepared for these athletes that are going to turn up because when these, the, the teams all come in, turn up, that's it, the competition is ready. Um, so we analyse every single um, team that's there. We have our, we have our coach analyse and they will, will, will know the players, we'll know, the, we'll know what corners they take, we know exactly the playmakers, we know everything about all these teams. So we are going to, to what we want to do as referees is to facilitate the best World Cup that these players can ever be in. And that's our target and that's our job. And we just go in, do our job and walk away and then just have these athletes then um, being the best that they can be. Um, so in the next couple of um, months then, I'm actually heading away in two weeks time for the playoffs in New Zealand. So we'll, 
we'll know who the, the rest of the teams are going to be in the World Cup. And then probably a couple of um, European uh, qualifiers or European games and Champions League. And then at home here, I'll do the top men's games in the National League. And uh, Anya and Lisa touched on it there. So the, the, the SSC or Tricity League now has the three um, the, the three things together as in the, the Premier Division, the First Division and the Women's. And that to me is, is huge because we're under the wrong bracket now and finally that we're, we're the, the same. So I will do the, the, the Women's Games and the Men's Games here at home. And as much as possible um, to stay fit, healthy and just maintain what I'm doing. Um, to be 100% ready for the girls to come over. <laughs> Oh, it's so exciting. I do, I get so excited talking about it. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> yeah, but it is. I think we're all excited about it and geared up for it. But it's very interesting from the referee's perspective because I think there is an assumption out there that the referees maybe, well, not that they're going to spoil a game, but they're not as an integral to the game as the players. And everyone's talking about the players. But from a referee perspective, there's so much work goes into that. What do you find the most challenging when you're involved in a World Cup? The most challenging is to switch off, do you know? Um, so I recently, like I'm, I'm able to, you know, I've learned techniques to be able to just switch off because, do you know, for me, when if to, on the pitch, it's, it's easy. Like it doesn't look easy, but it, it's easy for me because I'm trained and I love it and I'm passionate about it. But when you come off the pitch, you're still on a high and you're still going through the match and everything. So you need to know how to be able to switch off and calm down. So that's a challenge. So if you're not mentally prepared or know what your, 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 your switches are, your triggers are, you know, that could be challenging for some, some referees or some athletes or anybody, do you know? So sometimes you'll, you'll see me um, actually painting and <laughs> because I can just switch off and just put it on the paper. And it's, it was, it's one way that I can just change the brain and the creative side to the technical side. So, yeah. Good luck with it. We'll be chatting a bit more about it before we finish up tonight. But um, Katie, for you, as, as Roshi mentioned, there's a lot of highs, there's a lot of lows. I mean, the massive high last year, of course, was winning that gold medal. Tell us about it. Tell us what were your emotions at the end of it. Um, I think the biggest one was relief, really, because, you know, it's like that. It's something you dream of. You know, it's when you're training and it's you're out in like 6 a.m. on the river and you're freezing and you're like baiting up the river like, you know, you're, and that's, that's what you're thinking of. You're like, you're doing it for that. You're doing it for that. So yeah, I went into that race and I had no expectations, but it was the result I wanted. Um, so the initial feeling was just total relief um, and obviously then elation and like. Because when I say the highs and lows and, and the twisted turns that life always has, not only in sport, because you stepped back from the sport for a while, didn't you? Tell us a little bit about that. I know your beloved father passed away and you decided to take a wee break from that. How did that, how was that, first of all, for you taking a step back from the sport? So the step back from the sport, yeah, it was difficult. Like, um, it, kind of, it kind of was a natural end. Um, and obviously I took a lot of time making that decision but so unfortunately at the Paralympics the single um, which is the boat I won the medal in isn't a, a boat class so I have to do it in a mixed double and at the time um, the single wasn't even an event at the world championships so um, like it was the double or nothing and I was just training for for nothing really um, and we couldn't find a male athlete that I had to be a specific classification because para sports of all different classifications so um, I mean, the population was halved because it had to be a male, first of all, and then you have to try and find someone with a really specific disability, which is difficult, like, so, um, yeah, it just didn't work. Um, it also did coincide, though, with me starting college, so I replaced the, the time spent in the gym with time going out and having crack, so <laughs> it wasn't all bad either. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so it wasn't, like, it was tough. It was a tough decision. Um, but I got the call then when I was in third year college from the coach and he was like, Katie, the singles an event at the World Championships 
and sure, it was like a red rag to a bull. I was like, right, let's go, like, yeah. here we go. So I went, went straight back to it um, and, yeah, loved, it, loved getting back into it. And when you met um, your new partner for the Double Skulls, Stephen, yeah, what was your first impression of him? Oh, from the off, he just had that glint in his eye where he's a bit of crack and he's as stubborn as I am and we train really, really hard together and we, like, feed off each other and we, he's great energy and like that like sure I was spending so much time training by myself and like loving it but sure now I had someone to spend it with and everyone knows it's sure you go to a gym class it's just easier to train hard with other people um, so it made my job so much easier and much more fun because I had someone to do it with. And how often would you train? So we train two or three times a day um, I just moved down to Cork to the National Rowing Centre so we'd have usually two sessions a day and then sometimes on a Wednesday and Friday it'd be three. <laughs> Roisin, for you, uh, like training obviously is integral to being successful in any way in life. Um, for hockey as well, I mean, you've had to deal with some very key pressure moments, standing over penalties and taking them. Um, how do you handle pressure? What goes through your mind when you know, OK, if I don't score this, that's it? I certainly don't think that. <laughs> um, I, I kind of like to be in the driver's seat as opposed to watching. I think it's much harder watching. Um, and I, I think... I think I've always been comfortable with making mistakes and not getting things right. Um, and I think once you're prepared, you can be confident. So, um, you know, we've got a fantastic team psychologist at the moment who does a lot of work with us and I've worked with psychologists in the past that prepare you for those highly stressful moments so that you're thinking the right things, that you're prepared, just as you might be to switch off, that you're prepared, you know, in, in Donnybrook back in 2019 when we had to qualify for the Olympics. Um, I, I missed my first shootout and was surprised as anyone else when the head coach asked me to take the next one. But I knew that, I'm sure it doesn't matter that I missed the last one, that's no bearings on what my next one is being, because that's life. Um, and I, I was chuffed and delighted. And I think he, his backing backed me. Um, so I think it's all about your processes and trusting that you are prepared um, mentally, that you've done a billion against a goalkeeper, that you can fall back and you, know, you feel like you're in a training ground, you can just zone everything out um, and probably just try to make light of it as opposed to as opposed to what it really means. And then, yeah, then comes the relief when you get over the line. We're going to come to the end of this panel discussion, but just, I suppose, for young boys, young girls watching it in this, Michelle, like, what advice would you give them? You know, just totally believe in yourself 100% and just try everything. You know, don't just, oh, I think I might, just go for it, just do it, just get out there, you know, you know, you'll fail, but you'll get up again and you'll just succeed even better and bigger. So just just believe in yourself and do it. What about you, Roshim? What would you say? Uh, yeah, I think I always think that, it, you know, if I could do it, um, you're a young girl from in Limerick City that, you know, anyone can. It doesn't matter what the sport is. We're so lucky now that we have so much available to us, clubs, sports, um, role models for, from an array, array of sports. So. Yeah, just try different things. Uh, you never know what you're going to fall in love with and, and ask for help. Your advice? I guess definitely, you know, like dreaming big, it's so important. And, you know, set your, set your hopes high. But what's just as important is actually enjoying the journey to getting there because that moment lasts for 10 seconds, for five minutes, whatever it may be. But actually, like, like that, you've spent four years trying to get to where you are now. And like yourself you know like trying to qualify and myself trying to qualify for Paris like that's so much time spent trying to, for this one moment so it's really important that that time spent you're enjoying it as well so just to enjoy the journey. That is great advice. Ladies, Gurmila Maigi, Avelin Nocht, Ale Gilius, Abu Dhabi Mar, Uramainela, the Arab Panel and Shaw. Well done. That was good, lovely, and well, thank you. <laughs> Tonight we induct the second person into the Hearst Board Hall of Fame. Olympian, four-time cross-country silver medalist, world and European cross-country champion, winner of the London, Berlin and Amsterdam marathons. This year's inductee ran two hours, 22 minutes and 23 seconds, an Irish record set in 1998 that still stands today. Please welcome Katrina McKiernan. Katrina, great to see you. Thank you, Grania. Nice to be here and uh, 
really enjoying the evening and well done to everybody who received their awards and very informative evening and very motivational. Absolutely. What do you make of getting this award? Yeah, it's a great honour. Um, <laughs> I suppose I'm, I'm very down to earth and uh, my, I, told, I went, was in with my neighbour this evening and I was told her I was coming to these awards and she said, what award is it? And I said, it's the old person's award. So she, <laughs> she really gave out to me for saying that. But look, at it's, sorry, it's a, it's a great honour and, you know, we'll have a little chat here and I hopefully I'm able to give a little bit of inspiration to our sports people that we have now, our great sports people that we have here this evening. I want to ask you about running. What did and what does running, what way does it make you feel? Yeah, so I suppose, just to give you a little bit of background, I grew up in a very rural part of the country, in Cavan, and I'm the youngest of seven. I lived on a farm. <laughs> yeah. I lived on a farm, and there wasn't much else to do, to be honest. So I went out the back fields and ran around. With no expectations, I heard some of our speakers here this evening saying that they dreamt of their achievements, but I had no expectations whatsoever. Uh, of running in the Olympics or World Championships or whatever it was. I just ran around the fields for that sheer enjoyment, that feeling of well-being that running gave me. And I didn't like school. I was the youngest of seven. So I did feel that I had to, I had to make my mark in some way. And I played a lot of camogie, you know, back then in Cavan. The boys played football, the girls played camogie, and really that all, that's all there was. Um, you know, we, we swam in the lakes, we hit the tennis ball up against the gable of the house and just very, very simple things. If we wanted to go somewhere, we either had to cycle, walk or run. So I was building up a great fitness level without realising it uh, from a very, very young age. We lived on a big hill, so every time that you went down, you had to come back up again. And it was very hilly around the place. So, you know, I was getting very strong just from everyday living. I'm just wondering if you're the youngest of seven as well, did you need to be able to run very fast to get away from some of the older brothers and sisters? Well, yeah, everything was a competition, yes, to be sure. Uh, particularly with one of my brothers who maybe was about seven or eight years older. And everything we did, like he was good at football, so I would go down to the football pitch and I would kick balls to him so he could catch big high balls. And uh, I remember one summer evening we went for a cycle and it was always going to end up in a race but he got a puncture about five miles <laughs> down the road, but I kept going ahead. <laughs> there was no sympathy. I'm sure he would have done the same as well. So it was very, very simple upbringing. A good upbringing as regards diet as well, because I lived on the farm, so we had our own milk and we had our own meat. We had our own lamb. We had all our own vegetables, chicken, egg, eggs. Um, you know, so it was a very, very healthy upbringing. And I think that stood to me during my career because thankfully I never got sick really. Um, and that's a big thing, you know, before big events, you can prepare for months and years in advance and maybe in the week leading up to it, you can get sick. But I really put that down to the good start that I got on the family farm. Who would have you looked up to when you were growing up? Who were your role models? Yeah, well, there's a funny story with this, really. Um, as I said, it was a really just GAA community. Um, and I loved watching the Kerry football team for some reason. I suppose they were successful, and at that age, you know, you follow people that, you, that are successful. So I remember I went over to the press conference for the London Marathon, maybe three or four days before the marathon. And uh, there was a load of journalists there with their laptops in front of them. And I wasn't given away very much because that was going to put pressure on myself. So they were asking me questions and how do you think you're going to do? And I had just this one liner saying, I've prepared well, I'm looking forward to the race and I'm going to see what happens. So they weren't getting much out of me, but anyway, one of the journalists asked, and who was your hero? And I said, Pat Spillane. <laughs> <laughs> And this, these, you know, English journalists, and there was from other parts of the world as well, and they had no idea who Pat Spillane was. So uh, I didn't make them any the richer, but look, they were grey in the face. I remember leaving the, the press conference and they were sitting there at their laptops and they had absolutely nothing to write because I didn't give away anything. And I think, you know, that was the way I operated. 
we can sometimes say too much before competition and put pressure on ourselves and I'm so happy that I wasn't competing during, you know, with the social media now. It's, it, I believe that it's, has, it has to be done to a certain extent, but it puts a lot of pressure on our sports people nowadays. And, you know, my little bit of advice would be to do the bare minimum. I know with sponsorship and that you have to do some social media, but don't put pressure on yourself. You have enough pressure without putting it on yourself. What were you like before a race? And what I mean by that is when you were about to start racing, did you have a particular technique, um, mindset? How did you get yourself ready for a race? Yeah, well, I suppose all of that is done in the, in the years and months and weeks leading up to a race. But again, keeping things very, very simple. You know, some of the girls said there earlier, if you prepare well, you're confident. And then that alleviates a lot of the fear. Sometimes we're fearful because we're afraid of how we're going to perform. But, you know, prepare well, and that's, that takes years. And then in the, in the days leading up to it, I would just have said to myself, OK, I've done all the training that I could possibly do. I couldn't have run a mile more in training. And now I'm going to get on the stage and do my very best. And I would always say to myself, I'm going to do my very, very best. I know when I get that, to that finish line that I couldn't have run a half a second faster or a half a step faster. And once you do that, it does take the pressure off you because you know that you have done your very, very best. And that's all that can be asked from anybody at any stage. And once you do your best, within yourself, you're going to be happy. Were you ever superstitious or did you have any sort of rituals that you had to do, like maybe speak to somebody the morning of the race or avoid somebody that you didn't want to see or anything like that? Yeah, well, I did keep a very low profile. Um, I wouldn't say much before a race, as I said already, because that puts pressure on you. But um, I would say a few prayers, yes. I believed in, in praying. I, you know, I do believe that we have this inner strength. Uh, life in general can be difficult uh, and my way of, you know, I feel that there has to be somebody else of a higher esteem helping us through life and that gives me great comfort and yeah, I would pray. I always wore a miraculous medal in my shorts pocket. I felt that that gave me strength, gave me comfort and my mother is very, very religious. She'll be 90 in May and she has Alzheimer's now a little bit and it's amazing. She doesn't really remember very much, but she remembers all her prayers. And when, when you know, that to me that is, that makes me realize that there's something else there helping us on this journey. Um, and she could never watch any of my races. Uh, she would be out the back fields with her rosary beads saying her prayers. And I was very, very aware of that. Uh, in the last kilometre of a race, when my legs were hanging off me, I would think of my mother, I would think of all the people in Cavan, I would think of all the people around the country, and they were the people that got me to that finish line. And you all, as well, need to have something that is going to spur you on, that's something that's going to help you when the going gets tough whether it be family or whatever it is, different things, and even just thinking of all the training, all the hard work, all the commitment that you put in, um, just so that you can get the, the very best out of yourself. What were they like with the homecomings, Katrina, and the local people when you won and came back with the medal? Like, what was that like? What was your mum like when she saw all this happening? Yeah, it was amazing because, you know, Grania was a very, very rural part of the country. The school and the church was we were kind of, uh, what was it, two miles. Then the other side, a mile and a half, was the, the pub and the post office and the shop. So if you can visualize how rural it was. And again, that was a great driving force for me. I didn't go to scholarship to America. I was asked to go, but I was a home board and I decided, OK, I'm going to make it from here. Um, and again, as I said, during races, I would think of that, that I could do it from home. and. Yeah, it was like, a, it was, the people were really, really genuine people, really nice people. And on Sunday at Mass, I'd be running a race and the priest would say, now at the end of Mass, he'd say a prayer for Katrina that she, 
that she does well today. And as I said, I was aware of all of this. But um, yeah, when I would come home after, so I won four silver medals in the world cross country. Um, my children laugh at me, they call me a loser, but anyway. <laughs> Second best. But uh, I did manage to win the European Championships, so at least that's it. Uh, no one for that. But, uh, yeah, we had great celebrations. Every time I, 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 I got a medal, every time I got on the podium, we would go back to the local pub, I'd fly home and go back. And, you know, it was a great celebration, a great reason for people to get drunk and get stupid and, <laughs> and all of that. I remember after the London Marathon, and that was a very, very challenging race because um, at half ways I got um, stomach cramps, so I had 13 miles still to go. And I remember seeing Porto Luz along the side of the road and saying to myself, if I have to pay them a visit, I'm still going to win because I had my mind tuned that, you know, I'm going to win this regardless. And it just goes to show you the power of the mind. If you can switch it in the right way, the sky's the limit for you. And we need to do that in training as well. You know, to be able to just get into that mindset that I'm going to, I'm going to achieve, I'm going to. And there's no reason, I was talking to the girls there earlier, there's no reason why, just because we're a small country, I think we have to forget about that. There's no reason why we can't compete against the best in the world. Sonia O'Sullivan, I know, is a good friend of yours and you would have competed against each other. What way did you both help each other when you were running? Yeah, well, I was so, so, to be honest, so, so happy that Sonia was around at the same time as me because I didn't like the limelight and she took the pressure off me. So I was very thankful to her for that. And it's funny that her birthday is the 28th of November, mine's the 30th of November, so we're practically the same age. And... Uh, you know, we all know Sonia is a phenomenal athlete. Uh, but we knew, both knew that it's an individual sport and that you have to train very, very hard. So we respected each other. And, you know, Sonia was really, really good on the track. I was good on the cross country and roads. And, um, you know, it's just, you know, we're very simple people. Only, even though we achieve great things, you know, we're very simple down to earth. Anybody that met Sonia knows that as well. When you look at the Irish female athletes that we have now, Katrina, and you mentioned about social media and how that has changed, what, what else have you seen that has changed since when you were running? Yeah, no, I think you're very lucky as well to be in this time because there is a lot of support. And um, we have a vast amount of athletes over a vast amount of sports. When I was competing, it wasn't like that. And my best advice to you is, you know, I wish I could do it again. I wish I was, I wish I was your age again. And really be cheeky, be bold, take all the risks. Do the very best that you can do. You know, if that means leaving college for a couple of years, leaving work for a few years, and leaving no stone unturned, you only get one chance at this. And it's a very, very short time. You know, your, your, your career is very, very short. And you know, get help, get advice, all the advice, all the help that you can get and make the most of it. And when you finish your career, just you can say to yourself and be, have that comfort that you give it 110%. Um, and, you know, I just love to be back there doing it. And I, I hope I can get that across to you th here tonight that, you know, as I said, make, make those decisions and don't have any regrets. It's very, very short when you're my age, you know, you'd say, oh, I wish I had, I wish I had listened to Katrina and, you know, just go full whack at it. And, and uh, you know, you have a lot, a lot of time to live. There's a lot of living to do after. You know, it's not a commitment. You have a talent and really, really work on that and get the most out of yourself and enjoy the journey. As Katie was saying there, the joy is in the journey because, you know, if you don't enjoy it, you know, why do it? But... You know, it's, it's for a very, very, and there's going to be, we've all mentioned that this evening, there's going to be twists and turns and cul-de-sacs and all the rest, but that shows the character to come back again 
And, you know, we learned, as the saying goes, we all learn more from our, from our mistakes than we do from winning. So when you, and you're going to have bad days. You know, I have no problem in saying that there's more not such successful days as, you know, you have more days that you're not successful compared with the days that you have success. But really enjoy those successful days. But really work hard at it. And as I said, leave no stone unturned. I'm going to leave you um, with a final question because it's, it's obvious from Katrina talking here the passion you have for running and the love that you have for running. So even though you've retired from the sport, you, this is your, you, you have a business now I run with Katrina where you actually help people to be the best runners that they can be. I'm saying it's a job. I'd say it's, it's more than a job. I, it's not a job, I should say. It's just, I'd say it's something you just love being involved in. Yeah, I just, like, because I ran because I love to run. That was, that's the long and the short of it. I was successful. I was lucky enough to, to win some medals. Um, but I still, even, you know, on, on, on days that I didn't perform so well or that things didn't go right, you know, I, I knew the next morning that I was going to get up and get out again and run again and, and start all over again and get new focuses and a new vision and, and work towards my next, my next target. And I just love you know seeing people run and helping people with their technique and regardless of what level they're at helping them to get the most out of themselves and you know sport is great it keeps us grounded it makes us feel good in ourselves it makes us feel confident in ourselves we meet fantastic people along the way and um, I've gotten a little bit more into the sports psychology part of it now because I think that's such a big big part um, you can have all the training and the world done but if the mindset isn't good, if, you know, that can let you down. And I have a nice saying, my mind is a garden, my thoughts are seeds, I can grow flowers or I can grow weeds. So, you know, you really need to, when, when things aren't going so well, you, you may want to make sure that you're not letting the mind take over. Just switch it straight away and say to yourself, it's great to be able to do this, I'm doing well, I'm strong, and all of those sort of things. So to make sure that you don't let the mind let, that, so that the mind doesn't let you down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So congratulations to Katrina, all our winners and nominees this evening. We're delighted to see so many brilliant athletes here tonight and have such an amazing group of role models for the young girls and boys. Um, as the theme of the night was do it for her to all the athletes, I know a few of you have done it already. Um, if you have a few spare minutes, say hello to some of the young people on your way out. That moment will stay with them for a lifetime and you never know, we may see some of them at the Her Sport Awards as nominees in the future. The future remains bright for her women's sport in Ireland and across the globe. I encourage you all to think of your her, whether it's your sister, your mom, your daughter, your niece or yourself. Let's leave here tonight remembering the impact that each and every one of us can have. Let's do it for her. Thank you to, again to all our sponsors, to Three, Energia and Whoop, who have been incredible support of her sport, as well to our hosts UCD and our television partners TG Cahar. To our own team at her sport and the video team, thank you and congratulations on a great event. I look forward to seeing you all again next year. Slán agus